welcome to a Finance Guy podcast, a show for all genders and species about bringing some humanity and a bit of fun to the world of finance and tech and leaving you with a little something that can help you on your way. All right, please enjoy. Thanks. Oh, man. No, no, I'm, I'm going I'm to loop that intro because that was good, but now we're on the mics. So oh, now okay. this will be higher quality. So let's start again just in case. Welcome to Finance Guy's podcast. we got a very special guest today, Mr. Oshin Hughes. Thanks for coming on, sir. We love Oshin, you know. We love Oshin. Very, very happy to be here. Yes, yes, yes. The family. Uh, this is going to be a, a very, very interesting episode. I'm going to read a, <laughs> what is not going to be an entirely short bio, but I want to provide the background to get people started. Um, you'll see why this book is sitting here for a reason. Oshin is an author of two different books, but uh, let me just give you the quick rundown, okay? Uh, Oshin hails from Clendalkin. A suburb of Dublin, Ireland. Did I pronounce that right? Clendalkin. Clendalkin. Yeah. Um, before he went to university, he worked as a truck driver yeah, for exactly. a short stint. And then what did you study in university? Um, electronics. He's I just picked something so I could. In Ireland at the time, Ireland had probably one of the longest economic recessions between 1960 and 1990. Um, in history. That's a good run. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it is. It's almost unique in its ability to get a, a, an economic boom going. But, um, when I left school, second level school, I was only interested in getting a job and getting a few quid into my pocket. So I went driving trucks and I did that for two years and it was only when there was a bunch of strikes and things like that that I kind of said, okay, I need to go back to college here, ah. otherwise I'll be broke for the so rest of my life. You went back and did some, was it electrical engineering? Yeah, electronic and electrical engineering. Okay. Let's try driving Hold up. on a second. I got to give these people <laughs> okay. the, the real breakdown. <laughs> I know, I know. He, he, got, he got his degree. Then he, so he worked for, I don't know if it was a couple of jobs, but 15 years at Intel. At Intel. Intel yeah. um, and then in 2005, he was having some big life thoughts and by chance bought a DVD titled The Long Way Round. Yeah. A documentary series by the actors Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman, right? Yeah, Their motorcycle right. trip around the world. Exactly, yeah. So they did that in, they did it in 2004. Okay. And I saw it probably in 2005. It was in a kind of, I think it was September, and it was that Liverpool had been beaten 2 0 yes. on that day. And I was just in a particularly bad, I'm a huge Liverpool fan, but yeah. I was in a particularly bad mood and just. Put on the DVD and watched it kind of straight through, and that's what kind of that was what planted the seed. Exactly. Um, yeah. I got I got a few more bits that were interesting to me. In 2006, you did sort of a test trip around uh, Australia. That's right. In a four by four, and yeah. uh, when you got home, you bought a BMW Bumblebee 1150 GSA. That's right. And started playing this trip of a lifetime. I couldn't even ride a motorbike at that time. That was your first oh bike God. ever in history. Exactly. And, and then in just a couple of short, 2008, two short years later, you departed on uh, what you had later titled uh, the name of the bike as Sam Ganji. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Drove it down the Pan American Highway, which you began with a 9,000 mile warm up from Toronto, driving uh, all the way out to Dead Horse, Alaska, the northernmost exactly. town you could drive to, yeah. warm up on the Arctic Ocean there. And uh, he drove from there down to the southern tip of South America, all told a 167-day, 34,000-mile epic through 15 countries. Yeah. And that was what was captured here in the fantastic book that I made die roaming. Yeah. I binged read this over the weekend. <laughs> <Already>? uh, absolutely. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I was on yeah. my ass laughing the whole time. <laughs> and then I was doing some more research afterwards about when you got home in 2008. Yeah. It was the recession was going on. Yeah. And I think what, what I was reading online is that just the humdrum of normal life and the recession kind of got you thinking that uh, you weren't done yet. And yeah. um, if I'm not mistaken, you'll correct me on the stats here, but you took off on a second motorcycle trip, and that was 2009. Exactly. And that I had logged down as a 46,000 mile adventure across 27 countries, this time on a 2006 exactly. BMW Adventurer. And, um, including Mongolia. Include <laughs> across Russia, across Mongolia, the plan was to drive east from Dublin to New York, which had another mini adventure of riding the Pan American Highway, or yeah. most of it again. <laughs> Yeah. via a slightly different route, this time all of the famed Route of 40, yeah, which yeah. had a very significant portion at the end of the first book. And then that was captured in the follow-on titled Not Dead Yet. 
which yeah. is also exactly. documentary tech documentary series. Yeah. Yeah. Sid has told me about hours of video. Oh, I have, I have that watched, watched the entire um, um, video series, you know. I, and, and oh, it's this awesome. This is, I mean, and 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 so let's just let's just get into it. Twenty sixteen, you joined Amazon. You've been here for four years now. Exactly. Our paths crossed when you came over. Um, you joined as a cluster manager in London. Yeah. Moved to Seattle, and then that was where we met up. I think in two thousand eighteen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, yeah. that's the in a, the short story long so far. That's. Mr. Oshin Hughes, so. <laughs> yeah, it took a while. And like, <laughs> you could almost just break it all up into um, the, the Intel years. Okay. Which, which I'll tell was nearly 20 years, so I joined them in 94. Yeah. Um, and then kind of, there was two years traveling in the middle, and then joined here in 2016, that's, and have been here for four years. That's the yeah. two halves of your professional life with exactly, a, yeah. mini, a couple of mini adventures in the middle. Yeah, I think every year in Amazon is about seven years, so yeah. I can yeah. count this as 28. I had a full head of hair when they joined Amazon, you know, so. It's, anyway. it's unbelievable. I think the same applies for meals, you know? I think so, I think so. I mean, I'm kind of furry yeah, on the yeah. sides, and it's just, it's you running for the hills. The jar, yeah. It's all scratched off by trying to figure things out. But, I mean, there's so much to get into yeah. here. I think, like, one of the things I just kind of wanted to, to start with was, you But know, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question. Go, like, kick us off, please. Uh, so, Oshin, what is the uh, commonality between dysentery and writing a book? Dysentery. <laughs> well, the um, what happened actually, it's interesting, <laughs> this book was mostly written in Colombia um, because I got a dose of what we would call in Ireland the ring of skiddies, which is basically, um, I got some form of a, of a bug, let's just leave it like that, and literally couldn't walk, you know, more than two yards from the toilet when I was in Colombia, and that lasted I think for about 10 days or something like that. Oh so, my God. But while I was literally a captive audience uh, to the seat and I had a laptop and couldn't move, I basically wrote that captive book. Audience. So yeah. this, on, on, on the second trip, yeah. you wrote the book about the first trip. That's right. During yeah. dysentery. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it was just purely because there was nothing else to do. Yeah. And I had, a, like, I had fairly good notes and everything like that. So, And I kind of said to myself, right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this. Not with any... It was originally just a blog online, and I kind of got a lot of feedback in the blog that I should write a book and stuff like that. And then, you know, stupidly I did. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, it's a, it takes a lot longer than you would think to, to write one, you know. Well, I think like the Irish stereotype of being great storytellers yeah. is not a stereotype at all. It's absolutely true. Yeah. It, I was in Stitches. I, I wanted to ask you, and, and kind of take this however mm. you, you think is most useful, but I, I actually am a um, fellow overlander, not to the quite the distance of you, but I did a, um, a cross country trip in a Land Cruiser oh, um, yeah. from New York to Cabo San Lucas to Prudhoe Bay as well. Oh, fantastic! And back. So I like once I heard about this and saw it, I couldn't put it down. Yeah. But I, I kind of and I've talked to people who traveled before, and the first trip seems to always be the one where you really, really change perspective. And I'm really curious to know, like, how did you change from the beginning of the first trip? to the end of the first trip after that 167 day tour? I would say the, the big one is is that you get used to being on your own. Mm. So I would say my up until literally I was whatever age it was, but I was always kind of a people person. I always wanted to be around people. Yeah. You know, if I was going to the movies, I would always want to go with someone. Even if I was like, if I was going out with a girl at the time, I'd always want to go with <laughs> another couple. But once, whatever that, uh, piece of kit in you is that mean that, that kind of ensures you don't like being on your own you just break that mm -hmm. and then you're much more comfortable being by yourself and I've, I've read and looked at a lot of documentaries about people who do that round the world with bread thing on boats mm -hmm. you know where, where they're solo sailors yeah where mm -hmm. they, they could just go and I think the whip bread is a different one but the one where you literally go around the world by yourself in a boat yeah. And when they arrive home, the first thing they do is go straight back out again. That's so You know, funny. because you get just... Oh, my God. You just get used to being by yourself. It's a bit weird. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, mm -hmm. by the way. You yeah. know, you... I, I've heard the same thing. Like, I have a lot of friends who are Marines, you know, in Merchant Navy. And when they come back home, they just, you know, want to be alone. You know, yeah. Because they have been six months on the sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, this That's seems like noise, you know, to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally, I totally get it. Now, and I, I, but I still wouldn't necessarily think that that's a good thing. You know, mm. like you want and you, you've been happier by yourself rather than with people. I don't think is a natural human state. Mm. So I don't think that that's that's an outcome of it, not necessarily a desired outcome. I suppose. Yeah. 
So what were you looking for when you took off on the first trip? What were you trying to find? Well, I, was, I had just got divorced and I didn't have any snappers, which is in Ireland, snappers are kids, by the mm. way. Um, <laughs> so I had, and there was an opportunity going to take some red, like redundancy and oh, intel okay. and get, get some cash. And it literally just coincided with watching this long way round video. And I said, well, look, I'm, how old am I now? I'm 49, I was 39 at the time. And I said, I was just nearly 40. And I said, you're never gonna do this again. Mm. So just go and do it now so you don't. Don't spend your kind of whole life regretting that you didn't. Mm -hmm. And it it just turned out to be that it was a around the world motorcycle uh, trip, but it could just have easily been around the world on a boat. It was just going to be something crazy, and it, this just gave me the outlet for it. Like, cause I, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of books there about guys when they turn 39, 40, they want to go and do something stupid, climb Mount Everest. Cl um, Sail a boat. Midlife. Yeah, yeah. yeah, midlife crisis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And did you think, like, when you headed off on it, it was just for adventure? And I mean, I kind of am asking some leading questions because after yeah. reading it, I got the sense that you went off for a particular reason on a sense of adventure, some excitement, and that you kind of discovered you, you had a line in the book that you went off looking for happiness. And by the end, you kind of discover that as something you develop yeah. internally. Yeah, you bring it with you. Or, yeah, well, I would say. Oh, that's deep. Yeah, yeah. so you say your life is just everybody has these ups and downs, mm -hmm. right? And you have your good days and bad days. When you're traveling like that solo, the peaks and undulations of your mood just go crazy. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is, is if you're a bit screwed up mentally, let's say you're not in a good place, you may not. So you may travel to go, and, and, and I'm using kind of a lot of terms here which are very cliche, but you're going to try and find yourself. Yep. But you kind of have to be fully aware that when you find yourself, you may not have been worth finding. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you find out a lot of things about yourself there. Yeah. You go, hey, you know what, I'm a bit of an asshole uh -huh. at times, and how I think about stuff. <laughs> Beautiful. I can yeah. relate to that. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I agree. You yeah. would just say, you go, you go and find things out with yourself like this, yeah, and you kind of go, well, that's, uh, you know, was the, I, I would have been just as happy not finding it out. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, overall, like super, a super worthwhile experience. Yeah. But if you're not happy at home, I don't think you'll find yourself happy on the road either. Mm. You're just, you're better off just working on things that make you happy. Yeah. Right. Were you kind of naive when you started oh, thinking yeah. it would bring you happiness? Yeah. Or oh, he was going to go and. You know, I was gonna be a rock star. I'd, I'd be this, this kind, kind of exotic, exotic stranger, stranger pulling into some town in the middle of Canada. And, 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 you know. and reality, what happens is, because yeah. you're on a motorbike all day, you're covered in flies, and your, you know, your your face is completely windswept because it's red with the wind. So you have a face like a baboon's arse yeah. there, yeah. and yeah. you just kind of. Yeah. And, you know, you sting from t tip to toe, and in reality, there isn't anybody who'd want to come near you at all. But, you know, these are all just romantic visions. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. So. And you talked about something, too, is like the difference between being alone and being lonely. Yeah, yeah, totally and, different. And you mentioned, yeah. like, out in the sticks and in the city. Yeah, Talk yeah. about that a little bit. That was cool. Yeah, so if you were, I would say, the loneliest place you can be is in a city where you go to, say, a bar or a restaurant and you're by yourself. So we work for Amazon. So if you're going on a business trip yeah. and then you end up in the hotel and you're sitting there eating a meal by yourself with no one to talk to. So you're alone and I think in those cases, lonely. Absolutely. Right? Now, if you find yourself, let's say you're up on, in, in the middle of a mountain somewhere and you hiked up there by yourself, you are completely alone, but you're not, but you're not lonely. You're right? mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not lonely. You yeah. you just so happen to be on your own. Now, yeah. if you broke your leg up there, mm -hmm. you would start to feel lonely pretty quick too. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, when you put yourself in those positions, the difference yeah. between the two is, um, um, a, uh, yeah, I think state of mind. Yeah, know. it's a state of mind. But I, if I'm perfectly comfortable with being alone. Mm -hmm. you know but it's only when you leave people that you feel lonely yeah. you know so say for example you went to let's just say pick any city in the world you went to new york and let's say you've been on your own for two weeks which you often are mm -hmm. when you're traveling right and then you met a bunch of cool people that night and you had a great time and you had to go on your way you'll be lonely leaving right yeah because yeah. something has changed right it's a state change and yeah. in your mind you kind of wish that you weren't feeling lonely so what I found was, 
a great way of dealing with it is if you don't meet people, you never feel lonely, which mm. is bizarre. Well, uh, you mentioned early on the people yeah. you would meet and the first time you experienced like them leaving your life, yeah. realize you're never going to see them again. Exactly. Yeah. And then did you kind of like harden yourself a little a in little, future yeah, yeah, yeah. interactions? Yeah, well, how you harden yourself, and it's very unfortunate, is by not um, by not uh, investing in any of those relationships yeah. going forward. Cause, and it was really weird, because you're traveling every day. So every day, and especially when you're doing a circle, you know you're never going to be back here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So therefore, you say, if I do meet, let's say, <laughs> say you met your future wife yeah. in that place tonight, or someone who could be, uh, you're never going to meet them again. So then you kind of start to change about how much maybe you share and how much you kind of, so you do your, maybe your doors start to close a little bit. Yeah. I, think, I, I think you talk something like this when you are in uh, uh, Bolivia or someplace when you're sitting out of, outside a church. You yeah. remember that? Uh, well, Bolivia was tough because, I mean, it was uh, once you get south of uh, La Paz uh -huh. and, you know, maybe it, I think it's Aurora was the most southern town, but once you start to head over to the Salar de Uni, you're just on sand. So driving a bike on sand, uh, I think I crashed, like I did crash in uh, uh, on the sand, the bike was too yeah, heavy yeah, for it. Yeah. But yeah, you're pulling your bike up out of a ditch and you know, you've almost no water left and you know, your mind oh, starts to spin. Is, yeah, so, yeah, you start to spin out of control in terms of, you know, but you've only got this to, remind you of one it's totally your fault you're there Ooh. two it's totally your fault the route you took so you have no one to blame but yourself <laughs> you're stuck hauling your bike out of a ditch the sun is setting and you're completely lost and, and no water go. yeah and no water so you do t start to tear yourself apart in your head you know you call yourself every name under the sun yeah you kind of go what the hell were you thinking you know you you say you were arrogant and um, you know why did you think you could do this on your own but you kind of fight through it, mm -hmm. and eventually you kind of... Well, you kind of mentioned, too, at the end of the first trip, um, that when you found out, or when you knew the route ahead, you got to the very southern tip, then you backtracked a little yeah. to get to the airport. 3,200 uh, kilometers. Well, the, the yeah, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. a small little... Yeah, to, uh, to Buenos Aires is 3,200 kilometers. Oh, so that's Lord. like Indian, Indian northmost tip to Indian southmost yeah. tip. So like yeah. the entire India, you know? Yeah, of. but you, you mentioned kind of back knowing, back. knowing the route was a little disappointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though you were having all, you know, cursing at yourself on the yeah. way down, you found that, you, you mentioned that the hardship was actually what you were yeah, kind yeah. of after. Yeah, well, I think what, the thing about traveling is, I'm a firm believer, like if you think about emotion and how you feel, like you can break down the word emotion into emotion. So when you're traveling and when you're making progress and you see the milepost dropping mm. and you feel good. And if you don't know anything about the route, that, the route that's ahead, every mile you make gives you a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Mm. Yeah. So you're, because you're in motion, you feel good. Mm. Yeah. But when there's no uncertainty and you just know you just have to drive straight, and you have surety and certainty that there'll be somewhere to stay when you get there, there will be gas and all that sort of stuff. It takes the adventure out of it. Whereas if you're in Mongolia or on the route of Arty, you have no guarantee that there'll even be a road or yeah. that there'll be a path through. Mm -hmm. So that nervous energy is constantly alive in you. And it means kind of every sense in your body's at, like I used to call it, um, when you get off the bike in on the route of Arty or in Mongolia, right? you would be lathered in sweat. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I, mean, I, I think I called it bear sweat. <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's the sweat of knowing that if you screw up, you'll die. Oh man, yeah. Not the sweat of exercise, which yeah. is, is you do, like it's a totally different thing that if you come off the bike in a remote location, you're probably going to die. And you're trying to, that you've no choice but to get through. So you're sweating. And at the end of the day, you know, you take off your suit and it's just completely, saturated the whole way through you know you have a shower you're trying to wash the smell out of the suit mm -hmm. but that's com so completely different than if you were to drive from here to new york because all you got to do is put up the miles yeah correct and i'm not saying driving to new york isn't a great Tough. thing to do of course it is but it doesn't have the right. sense of failure in it yeah. you know that kind of you know you can do it if you've got the if you've got the money and the so uh, have you ever felt that you'll die oh yeah yeah lots like, of times yeah like what was the peak of it you know like oh well like, i mean in mongolia i was stuck in a river yeah and I remember. yeah i was 
trying to push the bike around. <laughs> and I, was, I wasn't uh, within 100 miles of any people. Yeah. So I would have just, if I didn't push the bike out, you know, let's say if I had just left the bike there, I would have died. Well, you could maybe have drank the water in the river. Um, and I'm a pretty fat man. <laughs> I'm a bit of pretty fat, right? So I think it would have taken me a long couple of probably thirty or forty days to die of hunger. So, <laughs> um, so I would, I would have, I would, like, I would have made it. I would have followed the track, and I would have followed it. So, yeah. but um, pretty tired though. Yeah, yeah. But when you're, but you know, you would have also known that the trip is over because uh, your bike is back there, yeah. and you've all your stuff. So you think that kind of feeling of you know you're waiting on someone to come when you don't even know if you're actually on a road like a lot of people don't realize in mongolia i think there's less than 100 miles of asphalted road yeah. and everybody wow. else is driving cross country so you have no way of knowing if the road you're on is actually like if you're on the yeah if, if this is the, actually a road mm -hmm. or it, because it's all just the ground is gravel yeah and it just so happened to be that's where i was after driving you know so you not knowing that is pretty scary how was that that second trip? How did it differ compared to the first? Where I feel like the first was like a journey from not knowing what a trip of that magnitude would be like. Yeah. How was it different going into the second where you had that under your belt? Uh, so the first one was like I would say everything up until Central America was a holiday, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, apart from Prudhoe Bay, now was really tough mm -hmm. um, up in Alaska. Uh, just from a like that's that's a tough really tough weather experience and uh, bad road. But Central America, but it's more fear of being shot mm -hmm. in Central America rather than you're not going to, um, you know, like uh, I think El Salvador and Honduras, they're all in the top 10. There's about five countries there that are all in the top 10 murder capitals. So you you don't travel by night, for instance. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you've got the bits in Bolivia and the route of Arty, which are tough. but. They're more political risks, uh -huh. whereas going east to west, there's definitely the you could die risk. Uh -huh. And then the <laughs> crossing into Russia is obviously highly political, yeah. that's tough going. But yeah, I think when you're in, once you start into Mongolia, and until, and when you're going up into the road of bones up towards Magadan, all of that, you know, one slip, and you're de you could easily be dead, or maim yourself, break your arm, break your leg, yeah. and you will literally, you know, they'll just find the suit in a couple of weeks because there's nobody, there's just nobody there. They're completely empty. Did you have a personal transformation on the second trip the way you did on the first trip? Um, I would say uh, I probably hit all of the possible depths of human elation and human depression. Um, that I'd say I probably went as high as you could possibly go and in the human experience or that I would think is possible yeah. to the ultimate depths of, um, you know, this is it, we're, I'm done and, um, you know, what the hell was I thinking type stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and you, the thing is, say you were driving from here to anywhere in a car, mm -hmm. or maybe you're there with your friend, you can turn on the radio and listen to some music and all that. When you're doing it on a motorbike, you can't. So mm -hmm. you've only the sound of your head. Yeah. Which is totally, and even your friend, if he's with you, they could turn around and it's like, if you were traveling together, shut up, Sid, what are you talking about? You'll have somebody there to get you right. Mm -hmm. But I used to, I stopped bringing a phone with me because when you leave, you know, you think people are maybe following your trip and how you're doing, but they're not. They've got on with their whole life. so. And every time I would turn on the phone and you would not have a message from home, it would be reminded that no one gave a shit. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. So you there kind of go, like, I remember when I was coming down on this boat from Magadan to Vladivostok, it's five days, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, down through the Sakhalin Islands. And this is a Russian freighter, yeah. no matter. Uh, this is not uh, the uh, 1970s Russian freighter, but we got to this piece where you could get a cell phone signal and, you know, no messages. And they're gonna go, come on, there's yeah. gotta be someone <laughs> who loves who is sending me a text just to say how's it going. Yeah. And no one did. So I was um, you know, that was a kind of a they're all pretty depressing moments, you yeah. know. So. Well what was oh, the man. impetus for the second one after you hadn't gotten to the the first trip? Well the done? second the second one was always the one I wanted to do because I always wanted to do the long way round oh, version of yeah. it. Okay, yeah. The circum and, yeah. Yeah, the only reason I did the first one was because I couldn't 
um, I couldn't get all of the visas done in the timeline. Ah. So, um, so you need a, for Russia, you need a multi-entry visa, ah. which takes a long time to get. Whereas you can go north to south in the Americas, literally Alaska to um, like Prudhoe Bay to Ushuaia, yeah. um, without a visa, I see. just on your passport. Travel, whatever travel visa, yeah. yeah, border, yeah. Yeah. Whereas you can't do that going the other way. You you need visas for. Um, well, Russia and Mongolia are the two big ones. So you just think I gotta, I like, I gotta do this trip. I gotta go out again the very next year. Is that kind of? Uh, it it wasn't it wasn't that straightforward. What actually happened was a guy um, wanted to film a documentary. Okay. And uh, he, this was on the second one, and we had started it. Oh, this is the guy who ditched you, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I like to think we ditched each other. <laughs> <laughs> It was a mutual breakup. Now, what happened was, um, yeah, so we, we had this plan to film it, and I wanted to film Dublin to New York, mm -hmm. but he wanted to also bolt on the Pan American piece. So he said, okay, fair enough. If you're all right with filming Dublin to New York, I'll go along for the second piece, of the, for the first piece of that one, and we can film it all and do it together like that. That was the plan. Yeah. But that was. I always wanted to do the Dublin to New York, and then the fact that this chap was, um, he was up for, did we want to film it as a team, and that just gave me a reason, and then we said, okay, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. and so you did the Pan American, then the Dublin portion. Exactly, then Dublin to New but York. But he dropped out? He dropped it, yeah, we split up in Honduras, and that was just, you know, it was pure naivety. Like we didn't know each other before we started, yeah. and the world um, is full of all these forums. You know, like I was looking at one, you know, Basset Hound forums, and kind of, you know, and motorcycle traveler forums, and maybe even Land Cruiser forums, right? Where people are going to X Y Z, but just because they're on the forum and you have something in common, doesn't mean you're actually going to get along. Oh, yeah. You know, you could just be completely different personality types, yeah. and. Um, yeah, so he, like, he, I'll give, uh, there was a cl clear distinction in our character differences. Like, he was the sort of guy who, if we came to a river, he'd like to camp beside that river for about a week and hang out. Mm. And I was just there kind of, are you fucking kidding me? Mm. A week mm. by a river? Mm. <laughs> now, what the hell are you going to do for a week? You yeah, know, I'm yeah. not used to standing still for even five minutes. Yeah. Like, to watch a football game is about the longest you could get me in one place. Um, and that was just a difference in, in kind of style and attitude and approach and what so yeah. eventually we just kind of said right we'll go our separate ways yeah yeah and um, I wanted to kind of just hit a couple of like really funny stories that I found in it there was I mean there's so many to choose from there was one where um, well, let me start with one that was in Canada that stuck out. You met a guy named Frenchie. Frenchie, yeah. Can you tell us about, <laughs> about that? Like where you were on the trip and what you were thinking and Yeah. Yeah. So Frenchie was up on the Alcan Highway and I guess he was uh, That's in Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah up, up in Canada. On the so, first trip. Yeah. So you're heading like just to put you um if you're in Calgary, you're about two thousand ca uh, kilometers northwest of Calgary. So you're up this is in the boonies mm -hmm. and um now, I don't know if there's actually a profession called a lumberjack, but he was in the lumber industry. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I was to call him from Ireland, I would say he was a lumberjack. But I may, what happened was, um, when the weather's bad in those places, you just, like, I mean, it lashes rain all day, it's freezing cold. So I just remember I was pulling into a cafe, just soaked and freezing cold. And um, it was between Fort Nelson and Fort St. John, but it was it was very far north. And um, I just got off of the cafe, sat down in this uh, cafe, and um, you always know it's it's a pretty serious cafe because there's no menu, right? It's just do you want breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? so, yeah, yeah. And is it only ask you do you want like a piece of that? They just assume that you're going to eat whatever the breakfast is. And uh, anyway, I sat down and I was kind of drying off, just swilling mugs of coffee. And then this dude came in, and he, I mean, he was like, I'm six four and probably two seventy, mm. right uh, pounds, right. And this guy was, I would say, he was at least three inches taller than me, but a comfortable a hundred pounds heavier, <laughs> but not fat. Like I mean, he was built like a brick shit. It was just <laughs> shoulders and, you know, big 
huge hands like and uh, <laughs> you know when he's just just these monster guys he's yeah. just there kind of going he's obviously in the right industry but <laughs> anyway I, there was nowhere to sit so I mostly sit down beside me and he was a kind of a quiet sort and I was just we kind of struck up a conversation but I think like one of the things I know well I hit it off him pretty close just because it, you know when you're freezing cold and um, you're not sure what the hell is going on. You tend to be yourself. Yeah, and then he just started howling and laughing. But up until that point, it was just kind. Of, so are you? You you live here, do you? Yeah. And he's just kind of going. Mm -hmm. And I was just there, kind of going. And are you uh, working in the? Are you like a lumberjack? You're working on the forest? And he kind of goes, yep. Yeah. And I was just kind of going, this is really. You know, <laughs> so, and then I said that next thing. All of a sudden, he was just kind of. Uh, he, uh, uh. he kind of. I suppose he relaxed. And we had a good chat about everything that was going on and what it was like to live up there and um yeah i remember that now it's i hadn't i obviously didn't know you were going to ask me that but um i remember that yeah that's 10 years 11 years ago now yeah i, I mean it stuck out to me because you just had all these little moments yeah. of like human interaction yeah and, yeah. Ran, and like yeah. you said you weren't used to leaving people forever yeah you yeah, kind of yeah. sounded like you missed Frenchie when yeah, you, you yeah. when he was there kind of going where are you going yeah. and i was just saying well i'm heading up there and all that and i said did you ever think about because i think he was driving like a big you know pickup truck i think it was like something like a chevy um silverado or something like that and i was saying did you ever think of driving up to the arctic ocean there just you know when you had a few days off and you went no <laughs> just <laughs> okay <laughs> but like it was just he was just, he belonged in that location, you know, yeah. in a certain way. And then I suppose I was just like a ship that passed in the night. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, he was, I think he was used to just dealing with, um, I think like obviously the, the forestry industry is up, up there. And yeah. Using it all the time. I don't, I don't want to stray too far from the trip, but I want to kind of ask about like, after having done these trips and then, you know, coming back, writing two books, the documentary, what was the Amazon origin story and like this kind of, almost back to the civilian world in 2016. Was that, what was the decision like to come work at Amazon? It was in London, uh, right? Yeah, so at the time I was working for Intel in Ireland and I had I was kind of reaching a point there where it was either stay there forever, right, or try something new. And one of my former bosses had left um, Intel to join Amazon and he'd given me a call and he said, hey, look, there's a job going here. Um, it's a startup in London, are you interested? And I went, and it was a kind of a now or never moment. And I did, I just said, okay, yeah, it was the right time. Mm -hmm. Again, I wasn't married, didn't have kids at the time. I mean, just, is that right? I did, I had one, I, I wasn't married, but I had one kid. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Should I book about it, so yeah. I can <laughs> yeah. fact check yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, so then we joined, yeah. uh, so I joined, but and then it meant moving to London. Uh -huh. But I remember with my wife actually, um, I said, hey, I'm leaving Intel. She went, really? And I went, yeah. I says, where, I'm, I says, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and join. I'm gonna consider a position with Amazon. She says, I says, we might have to move out of Ireland. Are you all right with that? And she says, yeah. She says, anywhere but London. And then I came back and says, hey, I got the job. And she says, well, congratulations. Where are we going? I said, London. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so it did, I was the first hire in London and then we uh, literally we had three large data center yeah. uh, from two providers in London but we walked into empty rooms there wasn't a desk there wasn't a pen like there was carpets in uh, you know these small office areas completely empty data centers no staff nothing and we had to kind of start it from there and launch the cluster um, you know what was that 11 months later mm -hmm. or just barely 12 months but I, in my first day in Amazon I was in Neo and I thought I had about three months to get up to speed because you know the timeline I think at, at the time for the startup was 2017 or something like that uh -huh. and then the first day I got to lunchtime get out of Neo and then there was a call it was my first call and I was on new, new employee orientation yeah, okay, okay. and they said they pulled it in three months so that oh, was it like yeah. that week I had to go to London and visit all these providers who I never met, and you know, go and work in the data center industry, which I had almost no exposure to. Obviously, I'd worked in the high tech sector, yeah. but not necessarily data center. So that yeah. was, and I think a lot of people have that exact same experience. They just walk in and they hit the tornado, and then it just carries them. And away. then you lose your hair. 
Yeah, what, exactly. What was your thought at that time about, like, how are you kind of, like, jiving with, like, the trip of a lifetime? Like, what was your outlook? What was your kind of philosophy on a career at this point? What, oh, what I, I thought I could do anything. I, like, I had no doubts in my ability. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was the key thing. Is that, and that's one of the reasons I left, with, left Intel. Intel has a lot of glass ceilings in it, mm -hmm. depending on where you are location-wise. For instance, you could only get to this level. You had to be in corporate. To, mm -hmm. uh, you had to be walking out of wherever, San Jose, to reach that level and things like that. And I had this feeling in my sense that I had no doubt that I could do whatever I put it, my mind to. And I wanted to go and find the big thing that I could put my mind to and then Amazon kind of gave me that opportunity but it wasn't it was more a kind of a professional piece where I said I felt like I'd done the personal stuff now I'd seen everywhere I wanted to see it had enough uh, part in and now I was going to say right I want to go out now and do really try and achieve something massive yeah. career wise yeah. and mm -hmm. I felt like Amazon was the right place you were ready to kind of build there yeah. in that kind of sense exactly and I think Am that's the one thing about Amazon um, and I'm not preaching a party line here, but the one thing, like in Amazon, you work hard, right? I don't think the benefits are any better than the market. Let's just say that. I'm not saying they're bad or anything like that, but they're, they're no better than the market. But the one thing that's here that uh, differentiates it from every other employer is opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's no, if you're good enough to do something, they'll give you the opportunity to do it. And they're never going to say to you, well, you can't do this because you didn't do this before. Yeah. Anything like that. If you're good enough, they'll let you do it. And that's, and like, if you look at the amount of jobs on the board, even in Seattle, like there's thousands. Yeah. But if you're good enough to do it, you get the opportunity. And that's just not true with any, any other company. company. Yeah. And I think that's why most, most people stay. Yeah. I agree. What makes people successful here? And you, you lead a, a pretty decent sized team now. so. I'm kind of curious. What, what do you think makes someone successful here, and how do you? What's your philosophy with your team? Yeah, when I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh, <I get> it. <laughs> uh, so, what makes someone successful? I think is starting fast, right? Um, you know, being tolerant of grey, right? Nothing is black and white. Mm. You know, the tolerance to ambiguity, to march into grey and into fog, mm -hmm. where you're not sure exactly. You know, you're kind of directionally right. But you don't know what the hell is tomorrow is going to bring necessarily. You have, you've got to be able to deal with that. You've got to be able to move fast. And I think then, um, you know, you've got to be a self-starter. If you're waiting on someone to hold your hand or show you the way, you know, it's probably not the right company for you. It's not, like, it's not the government. You know, you're not, nobody's going to hand you a pack. You know, here's where you learn your job. Here's all your response flow checklists. Here's all this. You're just going to have to, you're going to have to piece it together through 200 different wikis, you know, where somebody has been on this road before with you. Um, but to be successful here, you've just got to be able to march into grey and be happy doing it. And it's just like a road trip. Kind of. I was going to say, it sounds very familiar, this march yeah. into grey. Um, so then, yeah. what, what do you like, how do you lead your team? What's your philosophy as far as leading people? Is there anything, or are you just flying by the sea. Yeah, well, <laughs> I would say, you now, I'd be the first to say that of not everybody who's worked for me has liked me, right? So that's, let me just say that mm -hmm. first, right? Sure. Um, but what I would just be is honest, right? And maybe a bit too honest. Um, I suppose one of the things I would have learned is, you know, you can't be honest to the point where you're bursting people's bubbles, right? You mm. can show them the reflection a bit, but you don't have to smash the mirror for them. Mm. <laughs> you know, that sort of way. So it's kind of like, well, you know, I appreciate you think that's good. However, mm. Mm. here's how other people might perceive it, mm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you don't have to. Um, and then not everybody likes feedback the way you want to give it. Mm. You've got to be able to tailor your message for the people you're working with. But, you know, if, as long as you're, I think if you hire well, hire people who are comfortable um, like if you're having, if you spend all your day trying to coach people on the way forward, you probably have the wrong people. Yeah. Right. You should just be directionally adjusting. Yeah. Like I would just kind of say, like the analogy I would use is, what you want is almost like a wild horse, right? Who has all the energy and passion to move, and then you're just course correcting. Yeah. Not. 
But if you're kind of pulling and dragging someone and they're not <laughs> sure you have to explain everything to them, then they're probably the wrong person for here. Yeah. Um, the, or certainly in, in, let's just say, these kind of startup roles. There are roles where that's perfect for. Um, but but not here. Like a yeah. mature kind of. Yeah, mature. Product, yeah, you know, or, it's, or it's a super process driven company, mm -hmm. right? Where, and there are companies exactly like that. Like I would say accountancy firms are like that because if you were submitting your account, I want that my accounts to have the full process done on them, the full level of auditing and rigor. Yeah. You know, we're in a startup environment which Amazon kind of tries to maintain every day. That's probably not appropriate. Uh, and how did you move to the US, you know, then you were in London and... Uh, yeah, so I did about almost two years in London and then I t my previous role with Intel was a quality manager uh, oh, role. Okay. It was a defect reduction manager role. And then a role came up at hardware engineer and as a manufacturing quality engineer, so I took that, and that was, uh, that's again it gets you into the whole H one B and green card process. <laughs> so two years later, I, I got eventually got a green card, and um, which is I got that actually this weekend, believe it or not. Oh, so congratulations! Yeah, yeah, got it. So, is there anything kind of looking back? I guess, I mean, it's so non traditional the way you kind of went, but having that that great those great trips in the middle. But is there any advice you'd give yourself looking back? Anything you've learned now that you'd tell yourself? whether it was starting out your career or just someone who's 18 and getting out of high school, what what advice would you? Yeah, I think if I was, my, I'll be honest and say most of my advice comes from making mistakes, you know, so, <laughs> and managing to stand on a lot of cow pads along the way, right? Um, I would turn around and say, don't burn bridges, right? You're gonna meet a lot of people multiple times, right? So. Whatever interaction you're having with people along the way, maintain the relationship. Mm. Right? Don't. Um, that I think that's super important because mm. you never know when you're going to meet people again in in different companies. Like even in the data center industry, right? It's still very small, and you'll meet people again. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say be nice. Like is um, be nice, be friendly to people. You know, um, be an expert. Right? Everybody wants to deal with experts so whatever your field is you know drive yourself to expertise you know don't stay high level because if you can't like in especially in amazon you've got to be able to go from you know the clouds to the grass in the same day to the right? weeds yeah right you've just got to be and then you got to come back out right so and it's no one managing that transition but you know getting on with people people want to work with you you being an expert in it, and then you being results orientated, so that you're not just working on the stuff you like, mm. you actually have an end game or a result that you're working to. I think that's kind of what, you know, if, if any manager, if I was hiring anybody and they were results orientated, an expert and they were easy to get on with, that seems to me like the perfect package. Yeah. Right. What about from, you know, life on the road, what kind of life philosophy would you say you're living by at this point make progress every day mm -hmm. right make yeah. progress every day yeah. because I, if you if you don't feel like you're making progress and you feel like you're stuck in the mud you'll feel frustrated and i firmly believe it goes back to emotion right the feeling of making progress every day and documenting it gives you the positive momentum in your mind that kind of sense of yeah this is it and it gives you that bit of um up up and at him for the next day. Yeah. Like if you feel like you made no progress today and you'll make no progress tomorrow, well, very quickly you're 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 in a terminism. There's nowhere to go, right? Yeah. But, if you, but if you can, even a small, like one small win, can be enough to just, or maybe it's just a graph. You have all this data and you're you know you're overwhelmed with information and and all of a sudden you figure out one graph that can succinctly describe this problem yeah. and get everybody involved and all of a sudden it's such a big breakthrough because you didn't just help your understanding maybe you helped 10 or 12. Yeah th this happens yeah. with me you know, a lot. Yeah. I completely agree with this. Yeah it's like kind of a and then just those, that one little win can just yeah. get a bit of momentum going and once you have Mo, you know Mo is infectious. Right. Mo? Yeah Mo for momentum. Right? Oh, once okay. you have Mo, uh -huh. you know people when you meet them when they've yeah. got Mo, mm. right, yeah. and uh -huh. no stopping them. Yeah, you just keep going, and, and um, I think it is infectious with people 
they like everybody everybody wants to feel, have the feeling of momentum you know and if you can I think as a manager coach the people you're working with so that they can focus on gaining momentum then I think it helps them feel good about the job they're doing it helps feel good about you as a manager yeah but if you're it's tough to get like it's like the basketball you know once it's bouncing it's easy to keep it bouncing yeah but once it stops if you're trying to get it it takes a big lift to get it off the ground and bouncing again you know yeah do you talk about the trip with like your with people that report to you or no no they, they bring it like it's, it's funny because we just went for lunch there and my kind of rule is I don't talk about it unless someone asks me about mm. it yeah I've seen like, that yeah mm. yeah and it's just purely because it's not interesting because to, to most people because they like it's interesting that you did it of course it is mm. but if they if you don't have a frame a frame of reference for it yeah it's hard to talk about it like um I'm reading a book at the moment called Zen the art of motorcycle maintenance right? ah, yep. yeah. Right? Yeah. it's a uh, apparently it's one of now I never I've, I've obviously seen the book a lot but apparently it's one of the top philosophy books mm -hmm. but in, the, in it he, he talks about that he's sitting on the bike and he's driving and you know the wind is blowing in his face and stuff and then I'll, like well, as I'm reading that I'm transported back to being um, right there in the, in the trip you know so um, you were the question I'm, I'm after going off on the tangent this there. is perfect no, that's fine yeah we yeah. love tangents yeah <laughs> but but that whole that whole thing of being you know that's it that's kind of um, that sense of being in a moment right um, you know if you can get that in your job you know like how many days let me ask you a question how many days do you go home feeling like you nailed it today mm some yeah there are some mm -hmm. and when you've done it that feeling that's that's that you're in the moment you know that sort of way you just nailed it and that feeling is for you you get that a lot like you i used to get that feeling a lot when you'd be on the bike and it might be because you just got through the honduras el salvador border yeah and you're cruising down the road yeah yeah that's that moment <laughs> right yeah and you get it every now and then i don't know i, I probably didn't i think life is all about moments you know yeah well, You're living for moments, actually. Yeah, and I, I guess what I'm wondering is, like, when you see other young people, and you kind of had the, you ha you kind of had this sense of adventure that you just needed to go have. Do you see that in other people, where you think, man, they, they could go on an adventure? And yeah. Do, do you kind of, I don't know. Do you, do you think everyone should do something like that? Yeah, we're probably going to get kicked out. Okay. Uh, give, give me a minute. Give me a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Every, Every minute. Yeah. Everybody should be trying to kind of push themselves, right? I think. Um, I think I just <laughs> you'll probably be able to cut this out but it's it is taking care of the dark. Oh that happens every single episode. Yeah. It yeah, just lets them know it's very Amazonian, don't yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, yeah, let's kinda yeah. figure out a good way to I think this is a great place to maybe end on. Like yeah. this, this thought. But I, I think uh, Charlie, you know, I don't want this to end with Oshin. You know? we, we have to do I don't know. I think we can come back fifteen, twenty minutes. I think more, we can come yeah. back. But no let let let's kinda finish this this little thought that we're having here about Well what I would say is if all I would say with the with a young person and all that sort of stuff is for them to decide. Like I was actually given a teenager this advice just recently is that you don't have to make a perfect decision now. So say you're eighteen mm -hmm. or you're twenty or something like that. Go and study a technology degree of some kind because mm -hmm. it opens up a path to fifty different things. And you know maybe you don't want to. Let's say traveling is something you'd like to do. Well, pick somewhere to travel to yeah. and just go. Don't. Don't keep this aimless goal. Make a progress toward because it'll help you decide whether or not that is something you want to do. Like when we, I did a trip around Ireland and Scotland to help me decide if I wanted to go to Australia. Australia informed the Pan America. The Pan America informed around the world. Yeah. So just take a baby bite off it and see if it's something you want to do. But make sure it's meaningful to you. You know, don't do it just for the sake of it. Yeah. I think I think that that resonates a lot. It's like making a meaningful small step will kind of open up maybe what the right move is next. Yeah, you yeah. might not have the whole plan on day one. You'll get your, you'll start to wire yourself uh, for it. Yeah, you know, that sort of way. Like it's kind of, um, you'll start to build up a bit of muscle memory or whatever, whatever way you want to put it. But it's just kind of, um, if you know you're like, I'll give you an example. If you decide you want to do yoga, right? I'm going to become a, an ex person in yoga. Well, you've got to start by doing a couple of yoga classes, Absolutely. <laughs> right? If you're going to do a marathon, well, you need to go and run. Mm. There's no point in you going out and buying shoes and all that sort of stuff. Go for a run first and see mm. if you can enjoy it. Yeah. You know, or yeah. if you're going to be like, um, 
if you're going to do a master's in a two-year master's in IT we'll start with an SQL course you know a two-weeker yeah. you have the discipline to do the two-weeker before you start the two years you know and I think all those little get yourself a little win on the board mm. I think um, to, to me I feel like we're coming to a good natural, natural yeah. spot here and I, I really do want to tell people that like this book You'll have trouble reading it at bed at night because your wife will tell you to stop laughing so much. Right. I've got, what's uh, the next one, Not Dead Yet? Yeah. That's yeah. coming on Friday. That's It'll darker. Yeah, that's darker. I can't, Just be prepared. I can't yeah. wait for it. Um, I really feel like, um, I don't know, there, there's a lot in here. I'm going to watch the YouTube videos too. <laughs> but, I mean, is there any parting words that we didn't cover on here that you might want to just reflect from? Everything. Uh, yeah. All of it. Yeah, yeah I would just kind of, if I, if I was going to say, do I have any kind of life lessons on the whole thing? I'd just say what goes around comes around, right? So just be, try and be nice to people because you're going to meet them again, you know, and I know karma, people believe in karma. Karma is a bitch. Yeah, karma is a, but if you're, if you're, if you're a dick, then all you'll meet in the world is dicks. Now you said right. in the book, as, yeah. as you were meeting people just once yeah. and never again, you still mentioned the karma thing. Yeah. So yeah. even though you won't see that specific person. It's there. It's, yeah. You like, I do think that if you're if you're a genuinely nice person, you have a right to uh, expect that people to be nice back to you, and they are. Yeah. You know, but if you're not, you know, if you were nasty today, mm. right? And it's kind of like you, you like you can get everything you need to do done in every day for the rest of your life without being like an an AH, right? Yeah. 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 And I think, that, like, if you can do it now, I haven't said that, I guarantee you there's people if you talk to and say, well, what's, well, what's her she like? Well, you're an asshole. <laughs> and then, but I would never meaningfully try and be one. You know, I, don't, I, I, like, if that may, I may have come across like one, but I wasn't trying to be. I think there are people out there who do try. Do we? Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. But I think karma is, is yeah. kind of the name of the game here. Because it's coming back like a freight train. You know, it's yeah. coming back like a freight train. So if like what it, what you put out, you get back. It's as simple as that. I think that's it right there. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, man. That was awesome. Dude. No worries. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Yeah. You gotta hit the applause button. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Cool. Yo, what up everybody? Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Feel free to leave a rating, review, what have you, but most of all, go have a fantastical day. Okay? We'll see you soon. Goodbye.